Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Zorin's final lecture. So, Zorin. Yeah. Good morning from me also. Welcome back, everybody, for the last lecture now on this series on non equilibrium QCD dynamics. And so, um, what I want to start out with is um, somehow just showing you a little bit of an application of now somehow all of the methods and stuff we have learned. And uh, we'll then go on to somehow extend this a little bit further. And also, finally, I'll, I'd like to say a few words about somehow what could be the future directions of the study of the non-equilibrium QCD dynamics and, you know, where all of this may be going and what are somehow the opportunities that we, that we anticipate having in the uh, perhaps even distant future or so. With this. So, so what we did last lecture somehow is um, we extended if you want so a potpourri of uh, potpourri of methods a little bit. So in addition to somehow having these uh, classical statistical approximation, which allow for really first principle simulations and real time lattice, but only in the semi classical regime of the theory. Um, we talked about uh, different kinds of approximations based on uh, weak coupling expansion, which somehow ultimately led us to uh, kinetic descriptions and We've already seen that somehow these two different methods, they have overlaps in their, in their range of validity and, and how that can be very useful to understand interesting non-equilibrium phenomena that, that appear in these, uh, these kind of systems. So, what we, so we ended up with this, with this little cartoon here, right, which um, was addressing actually one of the somehow big challenges that we, that we put up of why we're interested in studying this in the first place. I mean, of course, you know, studying non-equilibrium QCD is somehow a topic of fundamental theoretical interest, right? And so, I mean, that should be interesting even regardless of, of experiments being out there, I would, I would argue, right? But of course we have this, I mean, we have this fantastic experiments around us, right? And we should really try and go and understand the physics that's going on, for instance, in high energy heavy ion groups. Now, of course, if you go and, and you want to do that, right? Then we know that somehow at the scales that we're currently probing QCD, the theory is probably not necessarily weakly coupled, right? So if I'm going to go and use actually my weak coupling approaches that I've somehow laid out to you so far, right? That's, that's going to be a little bit of a stretch, right? And so one should be aware that at least from a theoretical point of view, one is actually taking these approaches one has and then one is somehow extrapolating them beyond where you can really argue that they're, they're somehow strictly speaking valid. But nevertheless, I mean, in the absence of of, of perhaps better things to do, right? That's a, that's a valuable avenue to explore. And so, 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 so the first thing I want to show you is that somehow, you know, this whole discussion that we've had is not just, is not just of uh, somehow theoretical interest, right? But can actually be used to do something meaningful also in the context of, uh, in the context of heavy ion physics, right? And so, uh, so, so, so of course, the, the big challenge that we want to address there is somehow how does one actually describe so, sort of the early time dynamics of these collisions, namely the formation of a, of a hydrodynamic cold gluon plasma in these collisions? Huh? And so it turns out that somehow, somehow this is a funny story, right? So, 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 so naively you would think, right, so let's, let's try and go and solve that problem in a weekly couple of QCD. This should be simple, right? But it turns out the problem is actually remarkably complex. And it's, I don't know, it's taken the community 20 years or so to figure, figure out how to do this actually, right? And so the challenge associated with that is somehow really that actually this, this, this incredibly short stretch of, of, of non-equilibrium physics that's happening there very early on in the collision is actually by itself kind of split up into multiple regimes. And so there's sort of lots of interesting dynamics going on. And really the degrees of freedom somehow change as a function of time during this, during this early stages already. Yeah. So if we want to go and somehow start to set up a, a theoretical description of, uh, of heavy ion collisions based on, based on the ideas of weak coupling physics, right? Then somehow the natural starting point for this discussion would be, would be this framework of the color glass condensate effective theory, right? Because we first of all have to somehow start to, start to describe the, well, the platonic content of, 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 of our atomic nuclei, right? Which are colliding at these very high energies, right? And so the relevant degrees of freedom there are really these somehow small gluons, right, which preside in the incoming nuclei before they collide, right? Now, as we've heard from the lectures of, of Raju and Edmond, right, these, these small gluons are really abundant in their inside the nuclei, right? So again, you have a, you have a large occupancy 
of, uh, of small x gluons, right? And so that, is, that allows us actually very much in the spirit of somehow the, the, the non-equilibrium problems that we've discussed to treat their dynamics semi-classically, right? Uh, and so what you find doing these kind of calculations, and this is really amazing calculations that, that have been done, there's part of this you can do really on a pen and paper, right? Is that as these nuclei collide, what, what will basically happen is that they will generate some very strong color field essentially mediating the exchange of, uh, of, of color charge between um, between the charges that preside inside the nuclei. Yeah? So very early on, after a heavy ion collision, right, the state of state of matter that we that we expect to create, at least in this landscape of asymptotia, yeah, very high energies, where the theory should be weakly coupled, right, is this are these somehow strong color fields, right, which then somehow continue to expand into empty space yeah, as essentially the nuclei separate from each other, right? fields getting dilute, decaying into quasi particles, and thereby somehow the system becomes increasingly dilute. Now, as we've learned in our discussion, right, the only thing that we can somehow describe semi-classically, right, are states of high occupancy. Right? And so actually what will happen is that in this particular case, the plasma will actually get dilute, yeah, so in in the sense of not featuring occupancies which are much larger than Grand, allowing for a semi-classical treatment, before the system eventually approaches equilibrium. Yeah? And so that, that automatically means that if we, what we actually want to try and understand is somehow the emergence of hydrodynamics, which is, a, which is really based on an expansion around local equilibrium, right? So if we want to understand the approach to equilibrium, then the semi-classical approach is, is uh, unable to do that, right? I mean, it's intrinsically somehow far from equilibrium approach, and so we need a different, we need different methods to, to eventually somehow, somehow uh, describe the approach to equilibrium. And so what is done here is essentially, or what is, the idea is then to somehow exploit this overlap in the range of validity of semi-classical methods and effective kinetic theory, and thereby at some point essentially pass from a classical fields description to a kinetic description of the plasma, right? Which of course then, implies that we have to be able, I mean, we have to be reasonably weakly coupled to actually be able to do this. Yeah? And so what the kinetic theory will, will then be able to do is, it will allow us to somehow describe the transition of this sort of dilutish non-equilibrium QGP to a near-equilibrium QGB, which subsequently we can treat hydrodynamically. Yeah? But so, so, so the important is, so, so the point that, that, that's really to point out here is that even to under, so, so to really understand that problem at all, right, we, we, even that weak coupling, we actually already need a combination of different non-equilibrium <laughs> methods to do this. And so this is something that nowadays you can actually do, okay? Uh, so you can take this thing, you can simulate particle production, you can simulate the strong field dynamics at early times, you can match that to kinetic description, and you can then study the approach to hydrodynamics. Okay, and this is done here. Okay, so what is done here? So what is this plot, first of all? So this is just, um, I just want to show you, you know, somehow that, that this is something that we can actually do, and you, you can actually do beautiful things with this, this kind of physics that we've been discussing. So this is, this, this is a plot taken from a, from a study that we did, well, I guess over the course of the last three to four years or so, so it took us a really long time to somehow develop all the technology, which is, which is somehow showing the evolutions of the, of different components of the energy momentum tensor. So this is the transverse pressure shown in, shown in green, and the longitudinal pressure shown in blue. Uh, um, during the, some of the very early stages of a heavy ion collision, and then of course also going to later time, so this is a, this is a logarithmic time scale shown down here. Uh. Now, going back to this picture, right, so you somehow have to, you have to start with, a, with this classical field description, right? And so that is exactly what is done here. So in, in effect, what goes into this calculation uh, is a model, is a color, is a saturation model of the, of the um, distribution of color charge, if you want, so inside each of these nuclei. Uh, and that's then used to compute, first of all, somehow the strong fields that are present at the, immediately after the collision. And so, so you really see that the dynamics there is somehow field-like, right? For instance, if you look at the longitudinal pressure, right, and you will see that, in the, so this is longitudinal pressure to energy density ratio, right? And what you see is that somehow immediately after the collision, this longitudinal pressure is actually hugely negative. Yeah? And so that is, uh, I, mean, that's actually the, I mean, that's actually a simple consequence of both elect, color electric and color magnetic field basically being aligned in the direction of the, in the direction of the, uh, 
of the beam axis, yeah, and so if you have if you have coherent fields essentially pointing in a single direction, yeah, and the pressure in that direction will actually be negative. Uh, that's uh, like a well, the best analog in electrodynamics is probably this plate capacitor. Uh, if, you, if you take two parallel plate capacitors, then you have an electric field pointing between the plate capacitors, uh, and the pressure and the, the pressure will be negative there as well. Field pressure. Uh. Okay, so 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 that is somehow the somehow the first stretch of uh, of this thing, right? But then basically what happens then somehow during this uh, during these very early stages is that essentially the strong longitudinal collar fields, uh, well, they start to expand into empty space, not only longitudinally, but also transversely, but they also start to lose their coherence somehow. Uh, I mean, essentially, you know, what, I mean, what is a coherent field, right? It's somehow superposition of, super, superposition of different field modes, which all of which have somehow a coherent phase information, right? But then as these fields kind of start to evolve, right, they lose that coherence in their phase, essentially, they become incoherent. Yeah? That's when we can eventually start to think of describing them as quasi-particles, right? And uh, that's, then, that's then when somehow this curve starts to go from minus one, and actually the longitudinal pressure here starts to relax towards zero. Now, why does it start to relax towards zero? And that's somehow a simple consequence again of the, uh, again of the, again of kinematics. Yeah? Um, namely, if you, uh, I mean, so, so in, this, in, in this sort of asymptotic uh, scenario, actually what happens is that uh, if you study the collision and you look at somehow the particles that are being produced, right, then, okay, then it's already clear that at finite energy, they're somehow being, in their local rest frame, they're somehow being produced with a large, much larger transverse momentum than longitudinal momentum, because basically they're all coming from a point, right? So in the rest frame, they will essentially carry close to zero longitudinal momentum. And so it turns out that uh, actually classically, yeah, they're never really able to, to somehow pick up significant longitudinal momentum to start with. And so if you were to just follow, were to just follow, close your eyes, not know about quantum world, right, and just follow this evolution classically, then what you would actually find is that somehow this curve would, and that's actually shown here, right, this curve would you know, somehow just uh, go out here and sort of settle towards zero, right? You would never be able to somehow build up sufficient longitudinal pressure. Yeah? But okay, so at some point we know that uh, we should no longer describe evolution of the system semi-classically. So what you should do is you should somehow match this to kinetic theory. Yeah? And so I should say this is not, I mean, this is not sort of one-to-one -one actually matching this. We, 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 do a couple of, we do a couple of tricks there. Essentially, we exploit the fact that somehow there's a memory loss during the thermalization because otherwise we would really have to match somehow extract the full phase space distribution on an event by event basis and then somehow put this into kinetic theory, but this is very difficult. But you can make your life a little bit simpler, but that's not the essence of this plot. So the essence of this plot is that what you want to do then is you want to exploit somehow the fact that you have this overlapping range and validity and you want to then go on after some time, say here or so, 0.1 Fermi. So that's roughly this time scale one over QS that, uh, that people have been talking about. Uh, you want to go on and then you want to describe the subsequent interactions uh, using kinetic theory, uh, and so um, actually very interesting what happens is that there's a real somehow change in dynamics, yeah? whereas somehow the classical dynamics is really dominated somehow by elastic scattering, it turns out that in the kinetic regime actually radiative processes become incredibly important, uh, and uh, so they're actually, so, so, so basically the way this dynamics works is you somehow have your sort of semi-hard 1 GV gluons in the system, right, but okay, they're not really efficient in some of some scatterings are not really efficient in, in isotropizing their momenta, right? So instead what they do is they decay into softer excitations, uh, and then, if you have, then you have lower momentum excitations whose momenta can be much more easily isotropized. Uh, so that's roughly speaking the dynamics that's going on here. Uh, and so what that leads to is that then, once you pass it to some of a kinetic description, is that actually you start to see this rise of the longitudinal pressure, that is given that is uh, given then here by this uh, this full curve. So that is now a curve that comes from kinetic theory. Now, eventually, this kinetic theory, right? If you run it long enough, right, it'll be able to at least approach equilibrium. Now, here in this expanding system, right? I mean, this is actually somehow somehow non-trivial concept, right? Because okay, I mean, the system is somehow subject. I mean, you're constantly driving the system out of equilibrium by just by the very fact that you have this expansion, right? And so 
actually the question whether you whether you ever re I mean you, strictly speaking in the theoretical sense you're never going to reach a full equilibrium state there somewhere yeah, because you're always you're always pushing it out yeah? but you can approach that equilibrium state somehow yeah? and if you approach it close enough then what you would expect that uh, eventually you could you could describe the dynamics using the equilibrium methods and so indeed that's the case actually yeah? so after a time of about a Fermi or so yeah, um, you can pass from a kinetic description to viscous hydrodynamic description. Now, it's actually very important that this is viscous hydrodynamics here, not ideal hydrodynamics. Yeah? Because as you can see is that even by the time when somehow hydrodynamics starts to describe this evolution, right, I mean, you have a, still have a pretty, pretty sizable asymmetry in the pressures. Yeah? And so that's, I mean, that's given by the viscous corrections to hydrodynamics, yeah? whereas ideal hydrodynamics would just be one, both curves would be one third, and this, you can somehow clearly see that this is not the case. Yeah, and so, so this is really somehow now putting what we've learned into what we've learned into use, right? Namely, now combining some of the technology that we have developed, right? You can really describe the space-time dynamics of such a system from beginning to end, and you can actually do this on an event-by-event -event basis. Yeah? And so, in order to make sure that somehow you know these different curves match to each other, right? It's actually extremely important that they have an overlap in the range of validity. Yeah? Both somehow matching classical statistical to kinetic theory and also kinetic theory here to viscous hydrodynamics. Yes. Uh, so in this case, a good question actually. So in this case, we only put in uh, shear viscosity actually, which is consistent with. I mean, the kinetic theory we're using is the leading order effective kinetic theory, right? And that actually doesn't have a bulk viscosity either, right? Likewise, the, likewise, the classical statistical also has a conformal equation of state. Yeah. Um, you, you can match this differently, actually, if you match it to something which has bulk viscosity or which has QCD equation of state, you're going to introduce some sort of a slight discontinuity here. But then you can ask yourself, okay, now I run this whole event, right? Now I'm in the hydrodynamics, I can run the usual machinery that I run in phenomenology. Does this have any effect? Yeah? Answer is no. Yeah. Likewise, you can say, okay, what if I match here or here or here or here, right? And so with, if you vary somehow the matching within a reasonable range, right, essentially all, all the typical things we measure, say, be it, uh, be it uh, V2 or something like that, I mean, they're, they're really almost independent of that, actually. Yeah, so, 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 so first of all, okay, so, so, so first of all, okay, <laughs> so, 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 so there's a number, number of ways to answer your question. Yeah? So, so, so the first thing I'm, so, so, so the first thing is when I talk about this independence of initial conditions, right, so typically what I have in mind is somehow say a distribution, a single particle distribution in momentum space or something like that, right? And so clearly that you become independent of, right? Yeah, because, I mean, eventually the system approaches something which just has a thermal distribution, actually, right? And that will happen regardless of how I, how I, how I somehow crank the details of that initial condition initially. Yeah? Now, what is very important is the, for, I mean, what is very important in practice, right, is actually what is somehow the spatial structure of the initial condition. Yeah? Yeah, but then on top of each space-time point, essentially, right, I, I, have to, I have to somehow say what is my momentum profiles and so forth, right? So in that sense, it's, uh, so, so the same statement as it applies. Yeah? Now, <clears throat> one should say um, that, so some of the physics of these attractors and so forth that I've been, discussed, I've been discussing a lot, yeah? in principle can also play, I mean, can also play a role for these expanding systems. They use somehow have a different structure of these attractors. Uh, we, did some, we, we did some work on that. That's very interesting also, and it's very important in somehow figuring out what are actually the kinetic processes that should go into this description. Uh. However, what turns out in practice is, right, that after these very early stages, right, you have this, I mean, you, you just have this insanely fast expansion, right? And so this classical regime is really, is really only valid for somehow such a short time, right, that you actually don't have enough time to reach such an attractor. Uh, you're basically dominated by just having this rapid expansion, uh, and uh, actually not so much is going on, going on during this classical field phase. It's mainly this dephasing of these classical fields that you're describing, so sort of the process of initial particle production, right, and uh, that then serves as, a, as, a, as an initial condition for the subsequent kinetic equilibration. But you don't really have enough time to really reach such a, such a transient non-equilibrium state. Uh. Presum presumably for this you would you'd need really I don't know, much higher energies or something. Yeah. There was another question up there, yeah.
Okay, so, 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 so strictly speaking, here's what you should do, right? And this we've done in another context. That's not done in this plot, we've done this in another context. So strictly speaking, what you should do is you should take your classical fields as they are, right? And from that, you should compute the phase-based distribution of gluons in this case, right? You should really just compute f of xp, right? You can define that, right? You take your fields, you project out transversely polarized gluons, right? Uh, and you can make this uh, space and position dependent by essentially doing the same kind of Wigner transform of, of, of two-point correlation functions that I introduced yesterday. And this is something you can do. Uh. Um, <clears throat> what is done here is essentially, so here in this case we know that, and, and this is something that's important if you want to say describe systems where you're not sure whether they will actually go to equilibrium, right? Whether they perhaps will only just scatter once in the kinetic phase or something like this, then, because then you retain information about also the momentum space initial condition. Yeah? What is done here is actually, is actually not that. So here what we do is uh, we kind of just take a representative form of the, of the momentum space initial condition at each space time point yeah? and basically just, uh, just, uh, just assign, assign it such that the local energy density is the same for the initial condition in kinetic theory than that what we, what we get from the classical simulation. And that has the advantage that you don't have to, so actually the way you do this at the end of the day is you don't have to repeat the kinetic theory simulation for every event, right? But you can basically tabulate your knowledge about how this goes to equilibrium, and then you can really use this in sort of production scale runs of, uh, of, 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 of heavy ion phenomenology. Uh, but so, the, the, I mean, the theoretically sort of more satisfactory answer is to do the first thing, really extract the Wigner, this, I mean, really extract the phase-based distribution from the classical simulations and just run it. Yeah? It's just more difficult to do. More questions? So, um, using kinetic theory means you are assuming there are some quasi-particles. Yes. But for a strongly coupled theory, that may not be the case. I mean, Yes, that's, the, and I think I said that clearly, yeah. 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 Oh, so this is, this, so this so is you, taking weak coupling physics, yeah, right? Yeah. And pushing it beyond the range of, yeah. beyond, beyond weak coupling. Usually yeah. in hydro, we use the hydrodynamics first, and then in the gaseous phase, you, we use kinetic theory. Normal way, when uh, the system becomes weakly coupled, the latter time. But here you are using kinetic theory first, and then this. Yeah, here I'm using kinetic. So here I'm using kinetic theory to to somehow to somehow describe the approach towards a hydrodynamic evolution, right? And so it's true what you have to do is to get to essentially get approach to hydrodynamic on such a fast time scale, right? You have to crank up the coupling in your kinetic theory, right? So effectively, how we do it is actually we don't we don't we, we don't really use the coupling constant that is it, somehow our parameter. Or, as our free parameter, but we say, okay, we simulate the kinetic theory such that we get a certain ratio of the shear viscosity to entropy density ratio within that kinetic theory, right? So I think here in this case, it's chosen as two over four pi, right? That then that maps to a certain value of the Toft coupling, I think somewhere between five and 10 or so, yeah? and then that's what we run with basically. Yeah? But it's extrapolated to it's extrapolated to somehow real world couplings, yeah, because otherwise there would be no way you could somehow smoothly match to a hydrodynamic evolution at uh, <laughs> at values of the at values of eta over s that are being used in these simulations. And that's I mean that's of course I mean that's of course a major source of theoretical uncertainty, right? But that's that's somehow that, that's somehow the best we could do at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing you could try, for instance, you could actually go to next to leading order and weak coupling, and that's that's actually possible to do. Uh, and just just see, you know, whether does it have an effect, right, on the on the things you want to describe at the end. I mean, one of the things we found out doing these things is that, and in a sense, that's not surprising, right? I mean, in I don't know, 20 years of heavy ion physics, right, we've gotten around this problem, right, by basically just saying, okay, we start hydrate one Fermi over C without knowing what happened before, right? Okay, so now we now now we say okay, we have we have some way of describing what's going on before, and it's all very interesting, right? But can we see it in experiment? That the thing is, you actually have very little sensitivity to this, right? Uh, but okay, this this we knew, right? Because we were always getting around this problem in the first place, okay? No, 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 no. And I, I, so, so I completely disagree with this statement. Actually, I mean, in the strong coupling, I mean, in strong coupling, you find exactly the same. Essentially, I mean, this was one of the. This was yes. Let me. Let, yes, 
Yes, so, so let, me, let me finish my statement first before you object. Then you can object again, okay? <laughs> so, so, so one of the big surprises, right? That I, and I think this was one of the great things that was found by this ADS-CFT thing, right? Was that people found, okay, you say you study a system in, in, in one de Bjorken expansion, and you look how it, well, how it eventually equilibrates and how it approaches hydrodynamics, right? And so, so one of the big surprises there was that you can actually start describing the evolution towards equilibrium uh, hydrodynamically at a point where the pressure and isotropy of the system is still of order one. Uh, and so that's, that has led to somehow this paradigm change of not calling things thermalization anymore, but calling them hydrodynamization. Uh, and so, I mean, I mean, in strong coupling that was found quite a while ago by Chesla, Yaffe, Hella was also quite involved in this, I think, so these kind of people. I'm, I'm presuming, I mean, and presumably, actually, uh, Michal Hella will talk about this quite a bit, uh, quite a bit next week. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so, I mean, so actually one of the ways, I mean, and, and that, that, that's something that somehow impacted our understanding of, you know, why we think, you know, hydrodynamics, quote unquote, works in heavy ion collisions. It's, it, it's perhaps not because that system is somehow terribly close to equilibrium, but to a certain extent, at least, uh, the range of validity of this, or the range of applicability of this hydrodynamic description seems to be larger than we may have un naively anticipated just based on the power counting that goes into the hydrodynamic expansion. Uh, I mean, here, I mean, But, let, let, yes, I mean, so, so this is here, the, if you want, so the peak UCD attractor, but eventually, no matter how you, how, how you calculate these attractors in which, theories they, in which theory you do this, eventually they all have to go to actually first second order hydrodynamics, first order hydrodynamics, and eventually to ideal hydrodynamics. Eventually, yeah. Yeah, but the question is whether you can, yeah, okay, then the question becomes so, sort of how far you can push this and so forth. But I think we're drifting into some of a very specialized, very, very specialized discussion here. Okay, more questions on this or can I, can I, can I somehow move on with the, <laughs> the, with the other stuff that I wanted to discuss? Okay, so I just wanted to give you this as a, is somehow, is somehow a little example, right, where you can actually now put this, put this, to put this technology to work and, uh, and really, well, do something which I think is, is useful also in the context of heavy ion collisions. Okay, so from that, uh, let's, let's somehow move to, to, to a somewhat different topic, right? And let's, uh, l let's address a problem which so far we've kind of shed a little bit under the rug, right? And so we've used, for, so, so, so far we've been using, for instance, this classical statistical approximation, right, to describe dynamics of bosonic fields, right? And so we had, this, uh, we had this criterion for its validity, right, which was that somehow the occupation numbers have to be very large, much greater than unity, yeah? so meaning that we have very strong Bose enhancement going on in our systems yeah? in order to describe the dynamics semi-classically. So now, typically the, typically the theories that we're interested in, right, I mean, they don't just have bosonic degrees of freedom, right, but they also include fermions, such as the case in QCD, right? And so generally, we're not only interested in describing bosonic fields, but we also want to describe dynamics of fermions, right? And so there's a problem when it comes to that, right? Because if we look at fermions, right, then we, we, we don't have Bose enhancement, right? But instead of that, we have Pauli blocking, right? And so that means that, well, each quantum, each quantum state can only be occupied once, right? And so that means that somehow our phase space occupancy for fermions is actually limited to be less than unity, right? And so, well, if, if we then think about somehow describing this semi-classically, right, then it's, it's kind of obvious that this, should, uh, that this should fail in the very first place, right? So in that sense, you know, somehow fermions are, are always intrinsically quantum. You know? uh, I mean, nevertheless, we want to know something what fermions do in our systems, right? So, I mean, one scenario we can imagine, right, and that would, for instance, be the case also in, in these uh, early stages of heavy ion collisions, where we have somehow strong, very large gauge field occupancy, right? But nevertheless, we want to study somehow how fermions evolve in the presence of these somehow strong gauge field backgrounds. Uh, and so we have to somehow think how we can extend this approach to, to be able to describe that. And so there's, a, so there's actually a nice, uh, uh, this is sort of another kind of, of, of simplifications that, that, that occurs for fermions, right? Um, and there's really, there's really two ways of understanding 
how we can how we can include fermions into into this description. Uh, so the first one that I that I that I wrote down here and I'll, I'll briefly discuss is somehow based on based on the picture that we've always employed. Uh, Someone studying uh, studying properties of non-equilibrium field theories from the from the path integral. Um, you can also, in this case, it's actually very intuitive to look at this somehow from an operator formulation, and I'll go through that to the next slide. Uh, I don't find this discussion here very transparent, but I'll go through it anyways, because that's somehow, somehow been how we've always done it. Yeah. Um, so, so the advantage, well, somehow that, the, so the simplification that we have for fermions is that typically if we look at the theories that we're interested in, right, then the fermion fields only appear quadratically in their action. Yeah. And so at the level of the path integral, what that means is that we can simply integrate them out. And even if they don't appear quadratically, we can typically do things like a hubbard slatanovich transformation or so, and then we have an additional bosonic field, and then we can again integrate them out. Yeah? So typically, we can, we can simply integrate out the Fermion degrees. And so say, for instance, we look at our somehow usual 5 to the 4 type theory, right? So now if we, if we add fermions to that, right, then there'll be somehow a new term appearing here, right, which is this fermion bilinear term in the action, right, which is somehow multiplied by this, uh, by the inverse of the fermion propagator in the presence of that, in the presence of that field, right, but so now this is, this is somehow a quadratic integral, right, so we can integrate out the fermions, that would uh, give us the, the usual fermion determinant, yeah, which I've then put back up here in the exponent. Yeah. So now <coughs> that determinant, of course, still depends on the bosonic fields, yeah? and so it will depend, as usual, on the bosonic fields, on somehow our upper branch of the, of the, of the schwinger keldisch contour and on our lower branch of the schwinger keldisch contour. Yeah? But now what we can do is, right, so since we are anyway expanding in the powers of this, in, of this classic, uh, of, the, of, the, of the classical field over the quantum field, so we're expanding in the, well, we're expanding in, in the powers of the quantum field, right, neglecting somehow higher order corrections of the quantum field, right? We should actually do the same for this new term that we have generated due to the presence of the fermions, right? Yeah, so the idea is you integrate out the fermions first, right? You get something, some very complicated determinant which depends on all your bosonic fields on both branches of the contour, right? But then since you're anyway throwing out corrections which are of higher order in the difference between the two contours, you do the same part, you do the same thing for what you have inside the fermions. Right? And so you, you could actually do that, right? And so the result of this is, uh, I mean, I just wrote this down here. I'll, 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 you can find the details in, for instance, these two papers. So basically what you get at the end of the day is, you, on the one hand, you get one term, uh, which actually just gives you the fermion propagator, if you want so, uh, um, in the presence of this, uh, in the presence of having now just the classical gauge field trajectories. Yeah? Um, and so that really what that is describing is then essentially the evolution of a fermion on top of this classical of the classical field background. Yeah? So that's the first part that you get. And that is that is actually zeroth order in the difference field, in fact. Yeah? Then you get the next or term that you get is you get, of course, something that is linear. In the, in the difference field. Yeah? So the linear part was usually what, uh, what gave us the classical equations of motion, right? So this, this basically acts, I mean, this, this integral essentially generates a delta function. That's how we got somehow to our classical equations of motion, and we, we identified this classical aspect of this, of this part integral. Yeah? So now this receives an additional correction from the fermion, yeah? and so essentially what this is, this is the actual fermion propagator in the classical background field multiplying the derivative of the inverse fermion propagator with respect to the classical field. Now, what that is, is it's a very complicated way of writing, uh, of writing essentially uh, the current, uh, so the fermionic current uh, in the presence of the classical field, uh, which now back couples to the classical equation of motion. Uh, so the bottom line, I mean, this looks, and this is why I somehow don't like this, <laughs> like to write this here in the path integral, right? But the bottom line, what you learn from this, this expansion is that in order to study this dynamics, what you really have to do is you have to somehow calculate the fermion propagator, okay, on the presence of the classical gauge fields for each trajectory that you have, right? And then from that propagator, you have to compute the fermion current, okay, yeah, and feed that back into the evolution of the gauge field. Yeah? 
And with, if you do that, then you keep the same accuracy as you, as you did in the, uh, you keep the same accuracy in the expansion as you did for, for just the classical statistical approximation of the gauge field field dynamics. Now, okay, so there's somehow more, uh, which I find to, which I find somehow more intuitive, <laughs> more intuitive way of, of doing this, right? Is um, if you, and this is also actually how you do it in practice, okay? So say we want to now simulate the dynamics of fermions in the presence of somehow having strong fields, right? Then, okay, what do we do? Well, we discretize our theory on a three-dimensional spatial lattice, right? But now knowing that we have to describe our fermions quantum mechanically, right? Um, well, what we should do is that on, that on that lattice theory, we should now really solve the operator Dirac equation, right, in the presence of the field contents that we have. And so what I'm going to be discussing in the, pre the example I'll be discussing here will be for S, U, and C cross U1 theories, actually. Huh? So we really have to, so, 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 I mean, of course, the Fermion equation of motion is the, is the Dirac equation, right, which I've written here in this way, right? But now the fields that appear in this equation here are really operator-valued fields. Huh? So this is really what one has to include, okay? So, and then, okay, so, so to quench the approximation, so not including back reactions of fermions onto gauge fields, that would be actually already the full story, right? I could then somehow study all the fermionic observables that I'm interested in, right? Yeah. However, if I want to feed that back into the, into the boson dynamics, yeah, um, then what I should do is I should now go and and these bosons are somehow classical fields, right? They don't carry operator nature. Yeah? So the only thing I can feed back are actually expectation values of currents. Yeah? So what I should do then is I should basically, um, uh, I, should basically, I should basically calculate now expectation values of, say, the vector current here, yeah? which is just expectation value psi bar gamma mu psi, right? And then feed that back into when I'm solving the classical young Mills equations of motions or here or whatever electrodynamics. Yeah? Okay, and so, so, so in that sense, you know, I mean, this is really what this approach signifies is something like a, something like a time-dependent mean field type of approximation. No, it's also similar to what people do in, in time-dependent density functional theory, for instance. Okay, conceptually roughly clear what's happening here? Good, okay. So now, there's of course one thing which is, which is sort of awkward about this, right? This, so I have here this operator equation, right? How do I, how do I solve this, right? I mean, Right, so I know how to put a number on my computer, but how do I put an operator on my computer? It's not entirely obvious how to do this, right? And so the way to do this actually is then, um, <clears throat> is then um, you basically have to, well, okay, so, so the good thing here is by discretizing the theory on the lattice, right, you have somehow rendered, rendered this infinite dimensional Hilbert space finite dimensional for fermions. Yeah? And so, um, <laughs> So you can basically then go ahead and expand your operator valued fermion field actually in a complete set of operators. Yeah? So essentially what you, so, and so, so typically what you do is you look at your, you, you somehow look at your fermion field, right? You expand this into a basis of operators. So these are, these are here, these B and D daggers, right? So these are, if you want to creation and annihilation operators of, of fermions. Yeah? Taken at the initial time, yeah? so taken at the, at, the, at the point where you formulate your initial value problem. Yeah? And so you have essentially then somehow these, these static operators acting on your initial state, yeah? and so the entire time evolution of the system yeah? can then be absorbed into essentially the time evolution of what I will call somehow here the wave function. Yeah? So the wave function of each fermion yeah? um, is the object that is evolving in time according to the Dirac equation. Yeah? So what you have to do then is you have, you have somehow a complete set of operators, right? And solving the operator value Dirac equation then amounts to somehow solving it for the time evolution of each of these wave functions, yeah? so of each of the possible fermion states that you have created or that you could have created in the initial state, okay? Now, this really then gives you somehow the solution to this, to this operator value equation. Um, the problem with that is, is that this is extremely priced, okay? Yeah, because, so previously what did we have to do? We have somehow, we have one classical field, right? So that's a field in somehow the three spatial dimensions, right? And we solve one equation of motion for that to somehow propagate this forward in time. Yeah? Here, each of these wave functions is somehow a three-dimensional field, right? And so 
you have to solve for the time evolution of these, each of these wave functions, right? How many of the wave functions you have? Well, how many, the, the number of wave functions you have is the dimension of your Hilbert space, right? So for, for, for an SUNC theory, right, this would be four, which is the spin and, uh, so this is the spin and the particle-antiparticle degeneracy, right? Times the number of colors, that's the color degeneracy, times the size of your lattice. Yeah? And so what that means is that essentially, while well, somehow the numerical cost for gauge field goes something like nc cubed times number of lattice sides cubed, for fermions, this goes as uh, n to the six, or so lambda of lattice sides to the six. Uh, and so this is really a problem. Yeah? And so, 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 so just to, I mean, I got a question also, like, you know, how, 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 how difficult is it actually to do these simulations and so forth, right? So these gauge field simulations, you know, this is in principle something if you're patient, right? You can actually run this on the desktop computer, right? If you want to do this dynamics with fermions, you actually have, I mean, you have no chance, right? You, you don't have enough memory or anything. You really need access to supercomputers. I mean, here, so typically one simulation, you know, costs something like a million core hours, right? So that's a million hours on a, on a single, single core CPU. Uh, so things, so things get a little bit more complicated, right? But okay, right? I mean, you can, nowadays we have access to computing power. We can actually set these things up and we can actually study real-time dynamics of classical gauge fields in the presence of fermions. Okay, so, and so there's interesting things you can, you can do with this. Uh, so one example I would, uh, I would like to show you here of this is, uh, is actually something that's related to uh, quantum anomalies and uh, transport in the and then in chiral transport yeah? and so the phenomenon that uh, that I'd briefly like to show you here is uh, is what is called the chiral magnetic effect yeah? so really a microscopic simulations of the dynamics of the chiral magnetic effect yeah? which was some, which is somehow a phenomenon that was sort of first discovered macroscopically right but then has somehow really sparked a lot of interest in the in, in actually a variety of communities so what is the so what is the chiral magnetic effect and so sort of the Sort of the sort of the pocket formula versions of this is it's this kind of a new kind of conductivity uh, where unlike some on Ohmic conductivity right where you would create an electromagnetic current by applying an electric field uh, you can actually create an electromagnetic current by applying a magnetic field uh, but okay for this what you need is you need an imbalance of the axial charge uh, also an axial charge of the fermions. Uh, and um, I mean, so, so, so that is essentially to actually write down here such a such a relation between uh, between uh, uh, parity odd and parity even quantities. Uh, so this is very interesting, not only in the context of heavy ion physics. There's also a lot of stuff going on in, for instance, Dirac Weyl semi-metals, and so with lots of people being interested in this. Now, what we're interested in this is, of course, in the in the, in the context of QCD, right? And so, particular in heavy ions, I mean, this is this is somehow. This is somehow very interesting, right? Because on the one hand, we have somehow these very strong magnetic fields present at least in early stages of the collisions. Uh, but most importantly is, is actually that we can, that, 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 this, that the dynamics of this somehow the second ingredient, which is, which is the axial charge, is actually particularly interesting in non-abelian fields. Why is this so? Um, this is so because, um, well, because of the because of what's called the chiral anomaly you know, or the axial anomaly, yeah? namely, if we if we look at the at the divergence of this axial current, uh, which is the axial charge density and then its its vector components, uh, then um, that receives a contribution from what is called the quantum anomaly here, right? Where essentially fluctuations of the non-abelian gauge fields uh, can induce such an imbalance of the axial charge locally in space and time. Uh, there's also an explicit violation due to, due to someone having not chiral fermions, but having massive fermions here. Yeah? But so really the interesting part of this is, uh, the really the interesting part about this is that somehow fluctuations of the, of the non-abelian gauge fields uh, can induce such a chirality imbalance in the quark gluon plasma. Yeah? And so essentially, whenever you have a current that's not conserved, right, what do you expect it to do? Well, as a, throughout its space-time evolution, it should, it should generate some more large fluctuations. Yeah? And so um, what is the nature of these fluctuations? Uh, so it turns out that if you somehow look at what can contribute to this, to this, to this FF dual here, uh, then there's really two different kinds of things that can go on. Yeah? on. On the one hand, of course, somehow all the short distance physics can actually give you contribution, and you can get sort of this, this messy kind of things. Yeah? 
But then what should happen? I mean, what one usually expects to happen is that somehow over longer time scales, right, all these sort of short time, short distance physics averages out, uh, and one is dominated by somehow, uh, <laughs> one is dominated by somehow the, uh, the, the long distance mode of the theory. And so, so the second contribution that, that one can pick up here is actually a contribution from so-called, uh, I mean, from, from, from topological objects of the, of the theory, yeah, which are these so-called sphaleron transitions. Yeah? And so, so this is an example of somehow the space-style profile of the sphaleron. So instead of somehow having this complicated mass, right, you have these kind of localized objects, yeah, which sort of should create local bubbles of axial charge. Yeah? And this is related to really topological transitions in the gauge theory. So what do I mean by this? Okay, so this is sort of sphaleron 101 here. Yeah? So let me try to explain this. So, if you consider somehow a classical vacuum configuration on a three-dimensional slice, yeah, so then that's a state of zero field strings in the theory. Yeah, but okay, that is somehow so. So one way to realize this would be, for instance, through zero zero gauge potential yeah, everywhere. Yeah, but that's not the only way to do it. Yeah. In fact, there's a sort of an infinite number of possibility to do it all of which are equivalent to each other by gauge transformations. Yeah? So what is a gauge transformation? Well, if we are living on a lattice or more generally on a torus, right, then this is, this is somehow a map from the three torus to the gauge group, S, U, and C. Yeah? And so it, can, so it turns out that, can, that this map can have topologically non-trivial properties. Yeah? And so that's signified here by this, uh, by this, uh, by this set of homotopy classes. Yeah, which is pi three of S U and C. So this, well, what this means is essentially this is all the different topologically different ways that you can take um, <coughs> that you can take a torus and map it onto a gauge group. So the example that, that, that one should have in mind here is so can say consider you one gauge theory on a torus, right? So then, okay, you have to take each point on your. So this is this is my torus, okay? This is my U one gauge theory, okay? So then I could take all the points and I could, for instance, map them all around the vicinity of here. Yeah? That would be topologically trivial, yeah, because they all somehow lie in the vicinity of the identity. What I could also do is I could, for instance, take the points, but map them in such a way that I go around this loop once, yeah? so that I somehow cover everything once. Yeah? And uh, that would be topologically non-trivial, actually. Yeah? And as you can see, right, I could do this, I could wrap around multiple times and so forth, right? And so basically this would be the concept of a winding number. Yeah? And so what this object signifies is essentially something generalization of a winding number to, to now something mapping uh, three-dimensional spaces onto three-dimensional spaces. Okay? So the picture that one has and what one gets from this is then that essentially, okay, we have somehow not a unique vacuum, right? But we have topologically distinct vacua. Uh, and so what a Spelleron transition is, is it's somehow a real-time transition between sort of these different it would be these topologically different vacuum. Yeah? And so if you look at what this, do, what this does to somehow this FF dual term, so this is basically E dot B, okay? Yeah? Um, so it actually leads, so such a transition actually leads to an integer change of what is called the churn Simons number. So that's just the just a whoppa, that's just the time integral of uh, that's just the time integral of this quantity here. Okay. Now I should also say, so this is some of the discussion for vacuum, right? So generally, we're not, we want to study vacuum states. We want to study some of states of, say, high occupancy or so. Yeah? And so generally, this churn Simon number is actually not integer valued. Yeah? Um, I mean, one simple way to, to, to somehow, you know, get it to involve continuously is you just put parallel E and B fields, say, in electrodynamics, where you would have the same phenomenon, right? And then we just get a linear rise as a function of time. Yeah? So somehow what this includes in real time, you know, in, yeah, in, in, in real time, Minkowski's case is not only some of these topological objects, but it can also include sort of just ordinary fluctuations of fields and so forth. Okay, so, yeah, so, well, okay, I'm, maybe I'll skip here a little bit. I still want to have a lot that I want to say, actually. So you can do this, you can, so there's different ways to measure this on the lattice, right? So you can, depending on how you do this, you can, you can somehow really isolate sort of the topological content here, right? And you really have just this kind of integer value jumps, yeah? Or you can also include somehow these finite field strength fluctuations, but then you see somehow on the longer time scales, it seems to be always dominated by actually the topological transitions that are, that are going on in the systems, uh, and you can, 
you can, I mean, this is really beautiful physics you can actually do with these real-time simulations. Right? You can then measure the rates of these topological transitions and so forth, and all beautiful. Okay. Now, what we want to do is, I mean, we want to study really dynamics of the chiral magnetic effect, right? Or somehow actually see this quantum anomaly using these actually semi-classical simulations in real time. And so it turns out that, I mean, because these simulations are so expensive, right? It's, it's somehow very difficult to to go to large lattices and then really simultaneously resolve all these ultraviolet fluctuations along with the along with some other topological object. So what I'm going to show you here. Sorry, yep. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we have. So, 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 so I mean, this was a study which, for instance, was exactly using these kind of classical attractors, right? And then you can track how many of these topological transitions you have, right? And so again, you find somehow some scaling of the topological transition rate. Yeah, it's, well, I mean, everything scales in the system, so this should also scale somehow, right? And, but you find that it's actually very large in this, in, the, in this strong gauge field backgrounds, which perhaps is also not so, so surprising, right? Because you have somehow strongly nonlinear field dynamics, and so that should, that should somehow allow you to, to essentially jump over, these, jump over these topological barriers more often. Yeah, but so what I'm going to show you here regarding fermions is sort of a simplified setup of this kind of thing, right? Where we basically just take a single Sphaleron transition, you sort of throw out all the short distance noise, yeah, just keeping your topological content, and then you study how somehow the fermion evolves in, in that background, okay? Now, if you want to do fermions on a lattice, there's of course somehow this somehow this notorious problem, uh, and in particular if you want to study their chiral properties, this is this is even worse uh, that uh, you have to deal with this with this with this fermion doubling problem. Uh, so I said we have to do this on the lattice, right, to somehow render our render our Hilbert space finite dimensional, and so it turns out that if you somehow just work out the naive discretization of fermions, so just taking essentially the fermion field at one point and then somehow subtracting, subtracting it as the next point, and you can in principle add not only nearest neighbor terms, but somehow higher order neighbor terms. Uh, the dispersion relation that you will get, so in the continuum this would be, I've drawn it in a way that this would somehow, should be somehow a straight line, uh, so linear dispersion relation for, for massless, massless relativistic fermion, uh, uh, actually doesn't look like a straight line, but instead it has this kind of bending over, uh, where again, you, know, you get sort of light modes at high momentum. Uh, and so it turns out what actually happens is that these light modes at high momentum, they're actually the chiral partners of somehow your, your low-lying modes, so you, you, really, your modes that, you know, yeah, your low momentum modes, uh, and that actually leads to an exact cancellation of this anomaly. Yeah. So if you work out what is the so so if you work out what is the I mean what is the divergence of this axial current in this case, yeah, you actually you miss the term yeah, that you're actually interested in, namely how these gauge fields saw somehow fluctuations of the of the of the chiral fermions. Yeah. And so naive discretization clearly fails to somehow study study this dynamics. Now of course in the in, in the lattice community you know there there are ways that are known how to do this. Yeah? What we had very good experience with here is is using Wilson fermions, and so, so so this is somehow a funny trick in a sense what you do. So what you do is instead of just having somehow these these naive terms, uh, is you basically add a momentum dependent mass term, uh, gauge invariant momentum dependent mass term to your fermions, which then instead of this dispersion bending over makes your makes your high momentum fermions unphysically heavy, right? And so if they're heavy, right, that means, okay, you cannot excite them easily, so they should decouple, essentially, from your dynamics. Huh? Now, this, this, adding this kind of term actually breaks chiral symmetry explicitly on the lattice, okay? Huh? However, what you can show, or what has been shown, actually, at least in the context of Euclidean lattice theory, is that you generate somehow a new term, which is exactly proportional to somehow this quadratic mass, which is, comes from this quadratic mass term that you have put in, uh, but then this term in the continuum limit uh, reduces actually to what you want to get, namely to this, uh, to this field strength tensor, okay? Uh, and so that is one way to actually re then realize really this chiral dynamics also, um, also, uh, also for, for, for this real-time lattice. Okay, so now, this is, I mean, since this is somehow, you know, somewhat cumbersome, right, the first thing one should do is actually check that this works, okay, right, and so for that, yes? What? 
Well, the fermions are quantum, right? So, so you benefit from the fact that the anomaly here is one loop exact, basically. And you basically, the calculation you're doing is one loop exact, too. Yeah, because, I mean, you have the fermion operator, right? And you sum over all, you sum over all possible states, so that's like computing a one loop integral at the end of the day. So okay, so 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 since somehow all of this is you know somewhat somewhat gun some, right? Yeah, I mean the first thing you should somehow check is that, that that this actually adds up, right? And you you can kind of realize the chiral anomaly correctly. Yeah. And so let's first look at this somehow in the absence of a magnetic field. So there's not gonna be chiral magnetic effect here, but right, let's first make sure that actually over the time scale of a sphelaron transition, we induce the correct amount of axial charge, right? So, as I said, right, so the Svelon transition is some of this topological object, right, so for this, this Chern Simons number, which is actually half of the term that enters in the anomaly, uh, changes by an integer amount. Uh, so, what one, what one should get some of axial charge uh, induced during such a Svelon transition equals the negative two of the Chern Simons number, okay, and then there will be some sort of uh, so, 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 so some contribution. So, some of this will be dissipated, if you want so, yeah, due to explicit chiral symmetry breaking if you have massive fermions. Yeah? So we do this for very light fermions, then, then essentially this, time is, it, uh, this term is negligible over the time scale that we're studying this dynamics. Yeah? And so you can, you can track this over here. So this is somehow time in units of time it takes for this phaleron to, to, to somehow this phaleron transition to occur. Yeah? And so you can see black line here is the is the change in the churn Simons number, or twice the churn Simons number, right, which goes from zero to two, right? And then you can do this with improved Wilson fermions. We also did overlap fermions, which are even more complicated. Uh, and you really see that you get a very, very nice tracking of this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of behavior. And that's true not only somehow globally, yeah, so that's somehow the integrated amount of axial charge. You can also check off what this, uh, what this, what this contribution looks like locally. Yeah, and again, okay, so there you have some sort of more oscillating patterns, but somehow different curves are, are in very nice agreement. Okay, so then, uh, so we know we can, we, we, we can, um, we can, um, we can track axial charge. Uh -huh. So then, then let's, uh, let's try to look at the physics of some of the chiral magnetic effect, right? So what we can now do is we can somehow set up this phaleron transition, right? And we can now really look from a microscopic, from really a fully microscopic study, yeah? how does this chiral magnetic effect arise? Yeah? I mean, is there, what is going on there in the system? Uh -huh. And so, so, so that is something that we, that, 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 we, that we did over here. So what I'm showing here are actually I mean, these are actual simulation results, but not really somehow renderings of the axial charge density. Uh, so that's going to be this guy here. Uh, the vector current, uh, so that's supposed to be our chiral magnetic effect current, uh, but then also the vector charge density, right? So that's just the amount of electric charge, if you want, so that you induce. Uh, and so what you find is that, okay, so as you, so let's first focus on this left guy, right? So this is at the very beginning of the dynamics, right? So as you somehow go through your Svelaron transition, uh, so you introduce, you induce this, you induce this, uh, this axial charge imbalance here, yeah, which is which is signified by somehow this this red dot. Uh. Now, if you do this in a in a, in a non-zero magnetic field, and so the magnetic field is pointing in the z direction, that's why this is showing the z direction of the current. Then what you find is actually during that time that this some of the Svelaron transition takes place, you already you already uh, get a get a non-zero current over here. Uh, so you get current profiles which actually very closely resemble some of the profiles of your of your sphaleron, okay? Uh, but then what is a current? Well, a current is moving charge, right? Uh, so if I have moving charge, right? So now I, I take the, the fact that somehow the divergence of this vector current is actually, covariant divergence is actually zero. And so what that means is that actually the somehow positive, uh, I guess positive and negative charges, they, they accumulate at the edges of this sphaleron region. Uh, and so, so what you find is that actually during this sphaleron transition, uh, you kind of start to build this this sort of a dipole-like structure of, uh, of charges separating from each other. What is interesting, you can actually run this further somehow of um, beyond the dynamics. Yeah? Uh, and so after the Svelaron has, has somehow taken place, yeah, then you get this, this somehow propagation here. So, so, so like this, I'm going backward, now going forward in time. Yeah? You really got this propagation of, uh, of actually chiral magnetic shock waves. Yeah? So this is a phenomenon where essentially I mean, essentially, you have the chiral magnetic effect and another effect that can then give you, which is called the chiral separation effect, which can then really give you rise to somehow this propagating, this propagating kind of excitations. Uh, and so here's sort of a sort of a little picture um, summarizing this this whole thing. Uh, 
Um, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, let me just finish. Let me just finish. The, the, let me finish this uh, this up in a quick, right? Where you still charge being induced, right, over the course of this Phaleron transition, but then simultaneously, if there's a magnetic field present, right, you also find this the separation of vector charges, which actually continues to go on. Uh, this is the this is a phenomenon. That's the Carroll magnetic wave. Yep. Yeah, this Phaleron transition is, is it governed by some probabilistic law? Or? Is it based on what? How do, does it happen? I mean, Phaleron transi transition. What is what governs it? I mean. What governs it? So, in this, so, so, so I should say, so for this particular simulation, we just set it up by hand, yeah, simply because that's the easiest way to do it. Okay, so we just said, okay, we want to go from this vacuum to this vacuum, and this time we kick the field like this, then it goes. Okay, yeah. uh, usually in the dynamics, it just happens, right? I mean, it's just a, right? I mean, it's just a, like an over the barrier transition, right? Like you could have, I mean, say you have whatever, like a sin sinusoidal potential or so, right? Your fields would also just hop over the barrier now and then. Yeah. Uh, it's somehow, if you want to, the noise that's induced to the coupling to other excitations that eventually will will kick it over the barrier every now and then, and that's that's essentially what happens. Yeah. Okay, so you can okay, so you can in principle you can do a lot of more interesting stuff with this, and you can look at these slides. Yeah, for instance, I mean, let me highlight here one thing. So one thing that you can that you can actually also do is you can, for instance, now crank up this mass, uh, which is actually very hard to do in macroscopic because there's really because because you really have to start dealing with this pseudo scalar condensate, and there's somehow. Really, usually nobody includes this somehow in the macroscopic description. What you find is that as soon as you start to make these guys heavy, uh, of course, somehow the, 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 the amount of axial charge you induce gets very, very marginal. You also get very small vector currents and sort of the whole phenomenon just dies out. Yeah? So for heavy, I mean, of course, if you, it's called chiral magnetic effect. So if you don't have chiral fermions, right, then you also should expect, should expect no effect. And indeed, what, indeed, that's what you see. Okay, good. But so, so there's a lot of interesting things you can you can do with this. But so, um, in the last 15 minutes, what I would like to do is I would like to kind of wrap up, wrap this whole thing up a little bit, and, and somehow tell you a little bit about um, somehow where where some of these things could be going in the future, or what are somehow interesting, also new directions emerging in this in this field of non-equilibrium dynamics. Uh -huh. So this is essentially sort of a remake of a slide I showed in the first lecture, right? So what do we want to do, right? Is well, we want to study non-equilibrium quantum fields, right? And we have good motivations to do this. And so what we got to in this lecture, we somehow discussed different non-equilibrium methods, uh, but all of these were based on expansion parameters, right? Which are which are somehow well, not always necessarily small for the for the for the systems that we're really interested in describing, right? And so even though we've been able to somehow study a lot of interesting physics with the methods at hand, right, um, we were never able to get exact answers and generally to actually describe somehow um, complex physical phenomena, we needed to combine multiple theoretical methods. So the natural question to ask is, can we do better, actually? Uh, so is there actually a way that, you know, perhaps someday down the road, right, we could uh, we could perhaps really get first principle answers to to um, to uh, to non-equilibrium questions, right? And so there's uh, I mean there's a, so there's essentially two kind of avenues that I deem perhaps having somewhat of a promise in this direction, uh, and uh, just want to say a few words about uh, both of them. So the one idea goes into is actually goes based on this this kind of approach that we've been taking so far, which is based on uh, complexification, so based on the non-equilibrium path integral, right? But so there, the underlying idea is somehow to not uh, perform our integrations on somehow a real real field manifold as we usually do, yeah? but to somehow use the power of the of somehow going to the complex plane. Yeah? To eventually simplify the evaluation of such non-equilibrium path integrals or other path integrals that have a sign problem, and so there's there's different kind of approaches that go into this direction. One of them is, for instance, this complex Langevin method, uh, although that actually has severe problems. Uh, so it's perhaps if you want to get into this, this is not the <laughs> perhaps not the one that I would uh, would that I would uh, encourage you to look at. Um, there are other ideas related to what is called deformed integration contours, such as left set symbols and so forth. And I'm going to say a few words about these. Um, another somehow promising avenue, I think, is, is actually to somehow go back from somehow the approach that we've been taking uh, of 
somehow trying to simulate path integrals and so forth, right? And really go back to what was actually the very first thing I discussed, namely setting this problem up as a, as a problem of Hamiltonian time evolution. Yeah? And so, of course, this is somehow do, this is somehow the challenge that you always run into there is that you somehow have this huge Hilbert space that in principle you have to deal with. Yeah? And so, there's, I mean, there's two kinds of ways you could, you could try to overcome this. This is either by somehow really going to a quantum computing device yeah, where you can, in principle, realize larger Hilbert space dimension easily, although perhaps not in the, not in the near term future, yeah, or by actually trying to somehow really develop, a, well, say I have to live with the fact that potentially the Hilbert space I can, I can somehow simulate is very small, right? But let's try to pick the most physics out of the few states that I can get. Right? And there are very interesting techniques in, uh, developed mainly in condensed metaphysics, which come under the name of density matrix renormalization group or tensor network states, uh, which actually try to achieve exactly that. So they are essentially variational diagonalization techniques for for, for, for Hamiltonian evolution. Yeah? So basically what they try to do, they say is, well, I have, say, a thousand states I can simulate, right? Let's take the best ones to describe the physics I'm after. Uh, so there's kind of methods working in this direction. So I'm not going to say more about this, but I can give you references if you want. So let me, let, let me say a little bit more about somehow each of these, or well, a few of these approaches, uh, perhaps the ones which I find most interesting. Yeah. And so, um, so, so, so the first one goes into this idea of actually to just taking this beast and trying to compute it, okay? So why is this difficult? Well, okay, so let's consider for definiteness this, this uh, system which is actually in equilibrium, but now we want to study quantum real-time dynamics in equilibrium, right? So then we have our non-equilibrium path integral. Now our contour runs like this. We include this, this imaginary time path here, signifying the thermal density matrix with periodic boundary conditions, okay? Now what is the problem with just putting this on a computer? Well, the problem is that somehow this Euclidean part of the action, uh, in this case, we get a real weight here in the exponent. Uh, and so we can, if we, if we didn't have this real-time extent, right, we could just do this integration by important sampling Monte Carlo. Uh, so basically generating configuration according to a positive semi-definite weight, uh, and then just evaluating our measurement on that configuration. So that was, that's what Rajiv actually discussed last. Now the point is, as soon as you start to include this real-time part of this contour here is uh, uh, the action weight on this part is actually purely imaginary, uh, up to potentially an i epsilon that you introduce to, to, to render the integrals converge. Uh. And so if you look actually just at the phase that this integrand has, if you set it up on such a contour, then that's given here by this red curve. Uh, so the phase is anywhere between minus pi and pi uh, with sort of equal probability, actually. Uh, and so to compute anything from that is, is actually completely hopeless. Yeah? So it, it's just not possible, okay? So now, how can you get around this and get to something which looks better, like this blue curve? Uh -huh. And, uh, okay, so what you, okay, so what do you, okay, I, 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 uh, okay I'll, I'll say this for a bit. Uh, so, okay, so what, what, what do you do? Well, okay, you again discretize your system. Now, in addition to somehow discretizing spatial dimensions, you also discretize the time path and the Euclidean path. Uh, and so, then the basic idea of this approach is to, instead of somehow integrate over real fields, as we usually do, uh, um, we could consider a deformation of this real manifold into the complex plane uh, onto, some, onto some manifold where the sign problem is mild. Uh, so where instead of having somehow this flat phase distribution, we get a more peaked phase distribution so that we can actually go and compute some. Uh, and so what we would then do is, right, we would somehow generate field configurations with a probability on that manifold, right, and take the phase into account in the second step, uh, doing what is called a reweighting calculation. So we would weight every observable that we measure with, the, with its associated phase factor, and this would be divided by the average of the phase factor. Now, this is best understood at the end of an example, okay? So let's consider this one-dimensional integral here, okay? So the one-dimensional integral is e to the five i x squared minus x to the four, okay? Which we want to integrate over the real line, okay? This, the integrand in this thing looks like this, okay? So it oscillates like hell, right? And so I bet you if you do, if you, if you just put this into n integrate or something like that, right? It's actually, and you tell it to do it with Monte Carlo, it's not going to spit out a result, okay? Now, our integration contour here in this case runs 
along the real line, right? However, we know, okay, this integrand, right, is a, is a perfectly well-behaved function. It's a holomorphic function, actually. Uh, and so what we can then do is we can use Cauchy theorem, uh, which allows us to deform our contour of integration into the complex plane uh, while retaining the same result for the integral. Uh, and so suitable deformation here that you can choose, for instance, looks like this. Uh, so if instead of integrating along the real line, right, you integrate along this manifold over here, uh, um, then your integrand looks like this. Right? And so this integrand is now something that is perfectly amenable to important sampling evaluation of this integral. Uh, I mean, so you have a small negative region perhaps somewhere here, but okay, if you, if you were to actually choose this more clever, this would go away, right? But okay, other than that, that's basically a Gaussian peak, right? And you'll easily get the value. You'll easily get the value of that integral. Now, that sounds all very nice, right? Yeah. So, and what is the general strategy here, right? So the general strategy in this, in this kind of approach of complexification, right, would be to say, well, I have this, this horrible integral on R, R to the power X, right, where X is somehow how often I have discretized my thing, right? Yeah? And so what I want to do is, this thing has to be holomorphic, yeah? so the integral has to be holomorphic, essentially, or find holomorphic function of all variables. Yeah? Then I could rewrite this as an integration of a deformed manifold in the complex plane, yeah? and I could do this integral. Yeah? Now, in practice, how do I do an integral over some manifold in the complex plane? Well, I have to find the parametrization of that manifold, yeah? and so again, what you do is you, you find the parametrization of the manifold. You can typically do this in terms of Real number of real variables of the same dimension as, as the dimension of your manifold. Uh, and so you can parameterize your manifold in terms of some real variables. Uh, there'll be a Jacobian involved in somehow really writing this integral of the manifold. But then what you have to compute at the end of the day is something, is something like this. Now, that's all very nice, right? And uh, in principle, you know, should work very well, right? But however, the major challenge in this kind of approach is actually to find, first of all, find suitable integration manifolds, right? Which, where the sign problem is somehow mild enough, right? And then you also need to somehow find efficient ways to parameterize these guys, actually. Yeah? And that's, that's also a non-trivial task. Now, so in this context, there's somehow, there's somehow a number of, a number of uh, different approaches that that have been pursued or are being pursued here. So I've listed, so I've listed them here. Yeah? And there's, a, there's a few references down here that you, that you can look at if you're interested. And so the first one is, to, is, actually, is, is actually, if you want, so one of the mathematically cleanest ones, yeah? the, the beautiful mathematics behind this, which is, which is, uh, which is uh, called the left shade symbol. So the left shade, so what is, the, what is this left shade symbol approach? So roughly speaking, how it works is uh, um, you can actually write this full integral yeah, as a, you can decompose it into, into uh, a sum of integrals over stationary phase contours. Yeah? So you look at, so you look at uh, each of which is attached to what is called a critical point, so a saddle point of the, so a saddle, classical saddle point of the, of the action that appears in here. There's probably an I in here, I don't know. Yeah? And so along each of these, each of these left shift symbols, actually the imaginary part of the action is constant. Yeah? So you have, a, you have a stationary phase, right? So you have uh, along each of these symbols, then you have no sign problem if you want so. Yeah? And the only place that the sign problem in this approach comes back is by somehow adding up the contributions of all of these different symbols. Now the problem is that these guys are hard to find, uh, and so, um, and uh, yeah, so but okay, there are, there are ways you can try and do that. Uh, for I mean, for, for for simple problems like this one-dimensional integral, or so this is the this is probably the most beautiful way to actually do it. But then the natural question is, how do you do this in a high-dimensional landscapes? And there are ideas how to do it, but okay, I don't have time to really discuss this here. Um, there's another there's another kind of approach which is which is actually not somehow tries to go tries to go stepwise towards um, towards getting at better integration manifold and so that comes under typically comes under the name of holomorphic gradient flow or I think the algorithm is sometimes called contraction algorithms and so there the idea is that you somehow say you start with your integration on a on the real manifold, uh, but then instead of somehow saying, okay, I directly guess some crazy manifold that's going to be nice, right, you somehow continuously deform your manifold such that 
the sign problem will get milder and milder as you move on. Uh -huh. um, the way to do this is actually to, 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 to basically look at a flow. So you basically flow each point on your integration, uh, on, on your, on your uh, starting from your real space. Uh, um, with, with this, this is what's called the holomorphic gradient flow. So with the complex conjugate of the S, uh, of the S D phi, right? And so why is this a good thing to do, right? Well, what you can show is that actually, if you look at how the action changes under this flow, right? So the action of the flow point is compared to the action on the real manifold, uh, then what you'll find is that it will change by a real number. Uh, and so what this will mean is that the, <coughs> That typically, um, I mean, that will mean that you, first of all, your real part of your action, uh, which is actually controlling the convergence of your integral, is somehow monotonically increasing as a function of the flow. Uh, so that is important because that means that the integral remains convergent and well behaved throughout the, throughout the process of, of deforming your integration contour. Uh, but what it will also mean is that um, somehow only, only smaller regions will give contributions to this integral, actually, uh, and they will exhibit somehow less rapid phase oscillations. Uh, so you will somehow concentrate the integral around smaller regions uh, and thereby milden a sign problem. Now the problem that you that you trade this for, and this is generally true in somehow all of these approaches, right? Is you trade a problem which has a huge sign problem yeah, into a problem which has a very bad sampling problem, yeah, because then as you increase, say, for instance, the real part of your action, yeah, you introduce somehow these huge action barriers, right? So it's you know, like picture I had for the Sphaleron landscape, right? And then you have to somehow find efficient Monte Carlo algorithms to somehow to somehow jump between, say, different. <laughs> a set of different minima. Yeah? So at the end of the day, you don't really get rid of the problem, but you're just trading one problem for another. But that's a problem that's, in a sense, better known how to deal how to deal with. Yeah? There's a last class of approaches, and this is somehow this is somehow what I think people are mostly doing in this field nowadays, which is comes by the name of sign optimized manifold. So basically, what you do there is you do exactly what I did here. You guess something, right? You guess a family of manifolds. Yeah? Um, and then you basically try to uh, you have some param some free parameters in in there yeah? and you try to you try to essentially optimize them such that the tri such that the sign problem becomes better and better on these manifolds yeah? and you can do this with ex somehow explicit parameterizations or you can do this with neural networks I mean there's a there's a wealth of uh, wealth of theoretical stuff going on there. So just to somehow, okay, so, so here's a little bit of sort of what is the, what the, what is the ups and downs of these approaches, but I, I just kind of want to give you sort of, an, sort of a picture of how far this has gone in the context of real time or what you, we can, what you can sort of do with this today. Yeah? So this is actually an example, so this was kind of the same plot I showed you before. Yeah? So this is for an unharmonic oscillator actually. Yeah? So unharmonic oscillator with eight time steps, two steps in the, Two steps in the, no, no, this is, okay, this is a wrong copy of the label, okay, so this had, a, okay, but never mind, so it's an unharmonic oscillator, okay, and you can kind of do something like eight time steps or something. So now what this histogram shows here, so I'd shown you sort of the, the, the red thing before, uh, so that was the distribution of the, of the, of the phase of that, of that action on the real manifold, right, but then if you, now if you flow this, so this is using this approach of uh, holomorphic gradient flow, uh, so if you flow your manifold, so you continuously deform it, after some time what you will get is, what you will get is this, this blue, blue distribution of phases, and that's now something which you can actually use to compute something, yeah. It's still insane here, I'm gonna need 10 more minutes, I'm fine. Good. Uh, I mean, it's still insane here, right? So you can, you need like, I don't know, half a billion samples or so to just solve for half an oscillation of the unharmonic oscillator, right? Yeah, so, um, so you can kind of see, right? So this is the, so this is the unharmonic oscillator. So this is some real time, time order product of the field essentially, right? And okay, so you can see, you can kind of do like one oscillation here or so. Um, they also try to do field theory, so they have something like x sites and one, eight sites in one dimension. Yeah? But again, somehow this is still very limited to, to, to somehow short time physics. In this case, you even, you even only see half an oscillation. Yeah? So it's kind of a promising approach, right? But it's, it's not clear, you know, whether, whether you can really go to somehow late times and really study, study interesting dynamics beyond somehow these is very short-lived things, yeah? because as you, the longer you make somehow the real-time extent of your contour, the more into the more degrees of freedom you somehow add to this integral and so forth, right? And so the harder it gets in principle. Yeah? Okay, so now then, uh, let me say a couple of words about uh, 
about somehow another direction, which is based on, on Hamiltonian simulation, right? And so, as I said, right, that the basic idea there is really to, okay, go back, go again away from the somehow path integral formulation and really go back to the idea of just, okay, uh, uh, writing down the Hamiltonian of our system, right, and then just calculate, uh, calculate time evolution based on that Hamiltonian. Now, there's essentially three ways, I mean, there's different ways of doing this, so one of this, one of this is somehow this, this somehow variational approach of having truncated bases, doing this on a classical computer. There's digital quantum computing, and then in principle there's also a quantum simulation, where instead of where actually what you do there in, in quantum simulation is you would basically say, okay, well, I want to study QCD, I try to set up a cold atom system, which where somehow the cold atoms interact as if they were QCD, and then I try to run this. Uh, so you actually simulate one physical system with another, where you have better control. Now, I'm not going to say anything about that. What I'm going to talk about a little bit is say a few words about this digital quantum computing. So what is digital quantum computing? And so, this is, so, so the basic idea behind this is that, okay, um, what you have is essentially a system of spins, okay? Yeah. So what you have is essentially, of, essentially a system of spins, right? So you have spin zero, and so you can have state zero and one, say, right? Uh, and you can... You basically have a tensor product space of this of this of this system of spins, yeah? and this you can signify as a state like this, yeah? where somehow here we would have one, two, three, four, five, six qubits. Uh, each of them can be zero or one, right? So the dimension of your Hilbert space is somehow two to the number of qubits. Uh -huh. And so what signifies a dig 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 digital quantum computer is then that you somehow have a universal set of instructions, which in principle allow you to put any operator that could act on this on this tensor product space of, of spin one half. So, yeah. um, so you could put right, you write down any operator in terms of these qubit operations, essentially. Yeah. And so if you can write down every operator, right, you can also write down e to the iht on that thing, right? Yeah. And so it's then actually very natural to perform time evolution. Actually more natural than performing Euclidean evolution on this kind of device. Yeah. Okay. So the challenge then, of course, is right, what we want to simulate is not somehow it's not somehow just, uh, just spin one half, right? I mean, this is really just like a spin, right? So it's like up or down, right? That's the only thing you have, not a fermion, it's just up or down, okay? Right? So what we, what we want to simulate is not just up or down, right? What we simulate is something like QCD, right? Or, or field theory. And so essentially what you have to do is you have to map the theory that you have, right? First you have to somehow formulate it in Hamiltonian language, right? But then you have to map it on the theory of spin one halves, okay? And so, Typically, the way it's done, and so for, say, for instance, for scalar fields or so, this is actually this is actually quite well worked out. Is that in addition to somehow discretizing your theory on the lattice, what you actually have to do is you also discretize it in fields. Uh, for instance, if you look at your, for instance, if you look at a field operator, right? Then in essence, what you do is something like you say, well, okay, the field cannot now take any real value anymore, right? But it can only take some old truncated set of values, say one, two, three, four, and zero and minus one, two, three, four, or something like that, right? So roughly speaking, this amounts to a representation of this operator in terms of somehow a certain number of states n, where the field has a definite value times the projection onto that state. And so that's somehow how you then start to approximate all, there are all the operators making them finite dimensional also. Huh? Um, now, of course, if you want to get your field theory back of this, then in addition to somehow making the usual continuum and infinite volume limits, you will also have to, you will also have to take the limit where somehow your discretization of the field operator becomes dense in that space. Yeah? And so, um, so, 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 I mean, there's a lot of, I think, I think it's actually a lot of people looking also in what are the convergence properties of these kind of things. Um, let me show you some examples of what's, what's been done there. Um, there's probably more, but this was just two things I either knew or quickly found. Yeah? So, okay, so one of those so shown here on the left is again, so, so both of them have real-time evolution also. Yeah? What's shown on the left is a Schwinger model on two sides. Yeah? So essentially what this is, is exactly two fermions that you're simulating. Yeah? And okay, so you can do some real-time dynamics. One of the things, so for this you needed three qubits. One of the funny things that's, uh, that's part of the reason I show this is, <laughs> of course, when you're simulating this on a quantum computer, actually, right? You actually don't run your program once, right? Because, okay, at the end of the day, you do a measurement, right? Yeah? And so you actually have to repeat this measurement, right? A single measurement in quantum mechanics is, is meaningless, right? So you actually have to somehow program your quantum circuit and then run it many, many times to actually get out, get out somehow physics result, right? So here they did this 8,000 times, okay? 
And, but I mean, these are problems you can, I mean, you can actually solve on a classical computer much more easily, right? So these, so here always these noisy curves are what you get on a quantum computer, yeah? and uh, this, this, this solid curves also on the right is actually what you just get diagonalizing this on a, on a classical computer, yeah? and that's, uh, it's in this case much easier even. Yeah? Uh, on the right, there's a Z2 gauge theory shown also, so there they already had four sides. Yeah? So again, yeah, same kind of thing. But okay, I mean, these are somehow still let's say extremely small systems, but okay, I mean, it's nevertheless interesting that you can do something. Yeah? So what is somehow, so, so, so what is somehow going on there? So, well, I guess there are somehow conceptual challenges as well as, uh, as, as computational challenges in this. And so I think in, so, so, for, so, so for an audience like us, probably the most interesting conceptual challenges in this case, reduced to somehow what would actually be efficient ways or just generally ways to of discretizing in particular non-abelian gauge theories, mapping them on a on a, on a, on, a, on these spin one half sets, right? Because then you really have to, I mean, now you have to you have to think about discretizations of your of your of your of, of your of your compact group, yeah? And so one way to do this is, for instance, to using using non-abelian subgroups of your SU three gauge group or so. Yeah, but I mean, there's a there's, I'm I'm sure there's a wealth of possibilities of realizing these things. Yeah, and generally you would like to think about something that somehow retains as many of the properties that you that are actually fundamental for the theory, but uses as little states as possible. Yeah, so there's so that's really somehow the conceptual challenge that goes into the research there. And then of course, I mean, gauge theories are always somehow, re I mean, based on redundant descriptions, right? Yeah. And so somehow reducing the amount of redundancy is, 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 uh, would really be helpful in somehow reducing the size of the Hilbert space that, uh, that, you, that you have to simulate. In this. Of course, there are big somehow computational challenges in terms of actually realizing this and actually having devices that are, that are being able to simulate this. Uh, uh, so building and operating large-scale quantum computers apparently is not, a, not an easy task. Uh, um, there are also, this is actually, I mean, that's something that I think people in quantum information science are very concerned with, is that there's errors induced in the calculation due to some imperfect uh, isolation of the system from the, of your quantum, of your qubits from the environment, yeah? and so they'll I'll just every now and then do some, some random stuff, basically. Yeah? So presumably what, so, so, so this is, so, so I looked at, I think this, this review here, which was a, another review, which was a talk at the Lattice Conference, so what was stated there is that somehow, in the, in, in the near term future, what should be possible is somehow simulations on something like 50 to 100 qubits. So that would be Hilbert space size two to the power, whatever that number is. Uh, and then you can do something like on the order of a thousand two qubit operations, so operations on more than one qubit uh, before essentially errors kill you completely. Uh. Okay, so with that, I would, uh, I would like to wrap up here. Yeah, so, um, I show a picture of a unicorn here, simply because it's cool, okay? So, <laughs> so what have we learned about this uh, by, over the course of this, uh, of this, this few lectures? Uh, so I think w w what one has to say is that somehow really the description of real-time or out of equilibrium dynamics in QCD, this really remains a formidable challenge, right? So at the moment what we have is we have a number of different approaches which are based on expansions. They have their range of validity and you can really do exciting physics with that already. Yeah? Um, however, we don't have first principle avail methods available at the moment, and it's also not clear whether these will actually come up in, within our lifetimes. Yeah? Um, nevertheless, I mean, with that, you know, somehow really this area of non-equilibrium QCD, I mean, there's a plethora of things that you could think about looking at and doing, right? And so it really remains largely unexplored, yeah? so which is likely like that unicorn then, I guess, right? And so. I think that's actually a great opportunity for young scientists like you to also really have an, really have an impact on this, on this kind of field. So last thing I wanted to say, so I put here actually my, my contact information on this last slide. So if you have any comments, questions, complaints, feedback, uh, please, feel free to, please feel free to contact me. And with that, I would uh, like to thank you for really a wonderful, wonderful participation in this course and also thank the organizer for actually setting up such a beautiful program. It's really been Really been a great pleasure being here. Thanks. Uh, time for questions now.
Uh, so I have a question here over here. Yes. Hey. Uh, so you were alluding to uh, quantum computing, and this is always a hot topic and it's very speculative. But what would you speculate you would need in order to simulate something like what people do with the CGC currently? How many qubits are we talking? Well, I mean, you can. Well, I mean, you can do simple. I mean, you can do simple estimates, right? So it's okay. I mean, so so if you want to simulate a gauge theory, right? The first meaningful question is you have to ask, you know, like how many. So, so, so what would you do, right? You would take, so you would put your theory on the lattice, okay, right? So then you have some spatial volume, which is ns cubed, right? So that's gonna be part of our dimension of the Hilbert space, right? Then you take something like a gauge link, right? You have, well, you have three of these for each directions, right? And then you have to ask yourself, okay, how many values on the group manifold, right, do I actually need to somehow meaningfully represent the gauge link? This I don't know, right? So usually, as I said, this is based on this is based on non-abelian subgroups of SU3. Uh, I think uh, yeah, I have no idea what their dimension is, but let's say it's something like 50 or so, right? So that would mean, okay, you already need 50 states per link, right? Then you need all these. Then you need this per each lattice side and so forth. And very quickly, you will end up with a humongous number, essentially, right? So that's which presumably is not going to be what's part of this near-term quantum computing, right? So that's somehow so that's somehow a longer term challenge, right? Um, I mean, what I found very interesting, though, and I was actually not aware of that paper. Yeah, this is I mean, so so this I found yesterday, right? So here you here you do Z two gauge theory, right? Um, well, that's not QCD, right? But that's uh, that's nevertheless interesting to look at, right? And the Z two gauge theory has exactly two states per side, right? Uh, up plus or minus, right? And so, um, so, so there, presumably, you can do a whole lot more also in the near-term future, right? And uh, so this would be the kind of things that would be interesting to look at, right? I mean, you could probably do Z3 also, right? Which could be interesting, right? Um, question is, what do, you, what do you concretely learn for this, <laughs> learn from this for QCD? This I don't know, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll give you interesting things to look at. Right, and perhaps you will learn something from QCD about it, right? I mean, it's like, say, for instance, these inhomogeneous phases also, right? I mean, people look at the gauss neuver model, they say, oh, wow, there's an inhomogeneous phase, right? And they find this, right? And then, okay, you think about, could this happen in QCD? And you think, and Rob says, well, maybe actually yes, right? And so, so I think a lot of this, what, what perhaps one will see in the near-term future are things like that, right? And from actually putting QCD there and like, Measuring something right to three-digit precision, I think we are <laughs> we are way away, right? Questions? Uh, so, so in your um, holomorphic gradient flow, so you say that it will reduce the sign problem. Yes. So how do you ensure that it is after uh, simulation or before uh, you can see that? <laughs> means how do you ensure that that holomorphic analytic flow, uh, gradient flow, will ensure uh, reduce the sign problem? Um, yeah. What's the what's the easiest way to see this? Well, I mean, in principle, you can just monitor the phase and you and you you see it, right? I mean, it's I mean, it's it's based on this construction that essentially the real part of the action increases. So, um, so so basically, what happens is that. And the imaginary part of the action actually stays constant. Yeah? So basically what happens, so we can do it, for instance, for this example that I showed here, because they actually know exactly what the gradient flow does because I did it. Okay? So say you have, you have your, your, your integral on the real manifold, right? And okay, so I think this particular theory has a critical point here, critical point here and here. Okay? And so what your gradient flow would do is it would kind of so, so it would actually take, uh, yeah, it would eventually take somehow small areas yeah, around around these points yeah, and map them onto onto somehow larger extended regions yeah, in the in the parameter space. So let's see. Actually, I'm used to do this with the opposite sign. Yeah? Then I can actually draw something more meaningful if I may. So let's flip this so that the contour is flipped. Okay. So then what would happen is you would basically so once you flow from this region, you would map this point somewhere here. This point would be mapped somewhere here. This point would be mapped somewhere here, and so forth, right? And so you'd get this. Okay. Good. So you'd get something which looks like this, right? But this comes out of this original interval around here. Okay. Now, as I said, so the change in action here is purely real. Yeah. 
Whoopa, where is this? So the change in the action here is purely real. Yeah? And so what that means is that you now, the phase distribution that you have on this manifold is actually the same this phase distribution that you have on this small interval. Yeah? Now if you increase the flow, what will happen is that an even smaller interval will actually be mapped on this full thing. Right? Yeah? And so you get an even narrower phase distribution. Yeah? Now the challenge that comes up is that if you have, so, so in this case you have essentially one, so, so essentially at the end of the day you have, uh, you have one thimble that's contributing in this case. Yeah? Uh, what can happen is that you have somehow multiple disconnected regions, yeah? so that this kind of, say, this guy just goes up here to infinity, this guy goes down here to infinity, and then you have some now another disconnected region which, say, maps to something which looks like this also at the end of the day, okay? Right? But then what you will have to do in your Monte Carlo algorithms, is essentially you will have to find ways to somehow jump between these different things and so forth, and that's, that's the problem you're trading it then for. So you're getting a better sign problem, right? Uh, but you're getting somehow worse well, this is this overlap sampling problem, something like this. Yeah. But it comes from this exponential stretching, actually, that you get in this map. Thanks. More questions? Uh, if not, since uh, this is Zoran's final lecture, I would like to thank him for this is an interesting set of lectures on this new topic of non-equilibrium phenomena. And uh, uh, I'll just summarize these things, starting from this five-four theory that you showed the critical. Um, I mean, uh, the phase transition five-four theory. Then he showed us uh, this uh, critical slowing down and the new topics like. Uh, uh, say about this um, non-thermal fixed point to hydrodynamic attractor or say general attractors and how the system reaches equilibrium. All these topics were very new and fresh and so finally let's thank him again for this wonderful set of lectures. Yeah, thank you.